a look at a really cool part of biology and something that is always in the news and is always relevant. Um, but it's quite difficult to teach from a theoretical point of view because so much can go wrong. And what we're going to do instead is I'm going to run through sort of four examples of things that we can do to conserve species. Now, the thing about conservation is <clears throat> when we talk about conservation, what we're trying to do is we're trying to preserve the biodiversity. So we're trying to keep certain species alive that maybe are endangered, but the bigger picture of it tends to be uh, trying to keep ecosystems functioning, stop from turning into monocultures, keeping certain organisms that uh, are probably out of balance a little bit because of human activities and get their populations back on track and their genetic diversity. And the thing with conservation is it is so important because it's not just a moral obligation we have, but there are uh, treatments that we might be able to get for certain diseases from plants that might go extinct as a result of our actions, for example. So there's a large number of uh, factors, and I mean crops, for example, keeping crops uh, functioning, and we'll look at that when we look at pandas. But there's a lot of sort of there's a lot of really important sort of things that you don't really think about in terms of conservation that. I mean if we conserve certain species we actually benefit ourselves so let's have a look at a few examples and how we go about protecting them so this is probably the most common one it's wwf uh, flagship species and it's the panda now the panda in itself is one of the most useless animals going because it really just does not do very much right it it's its entire hat lifestyle was, I mean, it's got carnivorous teeth, but it only eats plants that are very low in nutrition, for example. It makes no sense. It's a very, very strange animal evolutionarily. However, the thing with the panda is the panda is part of an ecosystem that is being destroyed, which means that if you lose that ecosystem, you lose some very important species, particularly invertebrate species that are quite useful for the local environment for farming and things like that. But if I were to say, here's a bee, I want you to protect it, or even worse, you know, here's an ant, I want this ant protected, most people would just sort of go, oh, I don't really want to protect it. So what you do instead is you get what's called a flagship species, and that's what this is. So a panda is a flagship species which means that if I protect the panda, all of those other animals that come under it, that live in the same ecosystems that are actually important, are able to then be, uh, are able to then survive and thrive and keep doing the function that we want them to do. If the panda disappeared, no one would notice, but if the things that the panda's ecosystem rely on disappeared, we would. So <clears throat> that's why we call it a flagship species. People donate money to it and we use it to basically indirectly save other species. And we do that by preserving habitat. Okay, another one, right, white rhino. Now the white rhino you might be aware of has got these horns and is a prize uh, in terms of prize hunting. So people go to Africa and try and shoot these. And I think last time there was one male and three females still alive in the wild. So there's quite a lot of pressure to actually keep these around. This has been a result of poaching. So people go out and actively try and hunt them and then get their horns. With the white rhino, they have actually, the, the one male has got bodyguards with it 24 seven to make sure, armed bodyguards to make sure you can protect individuals. You can also do things like protecting the environment from poachers, so you know, na na nature reserves and those sorts of things where humans have very limited access. So there's quite a, the Serengeti is a good example of this, where they protect areas so that humans can't go in there, so that animals are basically safe from human interaction. So you can conserve the area. You can also do legal things like outlaw the trading of ivory, for example, would be a good method of um, controlling this. So there are legal ways of doing conservation as well. My first or favorite example is this, the uh, Florida panther. Now, Florida used to be this big marshland. Then we started building theme parks and all sorts of things in Florida and big city, uh, big towns, big cities, and it just destroyed their habitat. And it meant that actually the Florida Panthers, so if you think this is sort of Florida, eventually Florida Panthers started living 
in isolated areas and this panther couldn't get with the uh, guy here or over here or over here we broke it up so what we would do is we would create something called a nature corridor which is like a path a conserved thin path which allows organisms to pass between those communities and this is actually something that caused the panther to go endangered as well so it allows organisms to move between the different communities um, and then they can interbreed. Problem with Florida panther is it was way too far gone. So genetically speaking, they were breeding with individuals that were more closely related than you are to your mother or father. So there was a lot of inbreeding going on that caused a lot of uh, deformities. What they did was they got a, uh, a type of panther, a type of panther from Texas, which would be over here, and they flew it in and they bred and they mingled up, uh, they, they mixed up gene pool a bit and gave it a bit more biological diversity. So that is a possibility, but there are lots and lots of risks with this. Lastly, just to sort of remind you, this isn't just animals, so there are plants as well. So this is a spreading bellflower. It's one of the most endangered woodland species of plants. We can actually store the seeds. So we store the seeds for long periods of time. Um, and so that if we want to reintroduce a species, we can then take those seeds and breed them and then uh, introduce them to the wild. Now, this here is a lot easier to do because they don't move around and they're not so affected. They're not They're more predictable. Plants are more predictable to reintroduce into an environment than animals are. Um, and where the animals can sort of breed out of control, bellflowers don't, or flowers don't necessarily do that because you would only put them in the habitat that they they come from anyway.